Okay, good news. We're at the halfway point in the book of Ephesians now. And this is where everything shifts. The first three chapters are theology, doctrine, the why. What the first three chapters do is explain reality. What the next three chapters, chapters four to six do, is explain how we are to live in the light of that reality. In other words, first you got the doctrine, now you get the practice, the life application of how to live out what's true, and talk in here right at the end of chapter three, verses 14 through 21, is what John MacArthur has called the ignition switch, how to get all this going in your life. Now, usually when I prepare a passage for a sermon, I get a central image, something that jumps out at me as kind of a way to sum up and explain what the passage is all about. Like for my last sermon in this series on verses 1 through 13 of chapter 3, there was the image of the angels in heaven watching, studying us here at CBC to try to understand the wisdom of God. Well, that's a pretty compelling image. Before that, I had the image of Mount Whitney and Death Valley in California, the highest and lowest places in the U.S., within 100 kilometers of each other. How you can stand on top of Mount Whitney and look out into Death Valley. And that gave me a great image to compare where we were before Christ, dead, and what we are now in Christ at the top of mountains, so to speak. With this passage, I didn't really get one of those images. I tried. I memorized the passage, and I would repeat it to myself all week, running it over and over in my mind, trying to come up with that one image that crystallized what I thought the whole point of the passage was. I did my usual exegesis, the usual prep, got out one of Sue's old whiteboards and outlined the whole thing, learned a ton. Saturday morning I said to Sue, well, maybe I'm just taking the wrong approach. <laughs> maybe the entire passage is the image, and I've just missed it. It is an incredibly rich passage, filled with so much, and the point of the passage, as I finally came to realize, is probably the most simple, profound one possible. Let us pray. Father, I do ask that now you do speak through me, Holy Spirit, that the words I say are the words you want me to say, and Holy Spirit, quicken it to these wonderful people's hearts and minds so they get the benefit you want them to get out of it. Amen. Well, let's read this deep, deep passage, Ephesians three fourteen to 21. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now, to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we see, sorry, than all we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Well, the theme that took me so long to get is probably clear to you already. It's love. Love, strength, and power, but, yeah, primarily love. I mean, it's so obvious to me now. <laughs> and it's not that there's anything unusual about it, right? The Bible's full of love. Love's all over the place. God's love, Christ's love, our love for God. You can't sling a bucket of M&Ms in the Psalms without hitting love half a dozen times, right? I mean, it's not exactly a rare topic in the Bible. But what's amazing, the more I thought about it, is how this prayer of Paul's for the Ephesian church sums up the whole theological, doctrinal half of the whole first chapters 1 through 3 of Ephesians. Because at its core, what we're going to look today, it's a prayer of Paul's. It's a very simple prayer. Essentially, it's a prayer that the people in the church would know the love of Christ. Knowing the love of Christ, they would then know the power the strength that comes from being rooted and grounded firmly in the love of Christ. 
I mean, it, it's, you know, that's not a surprise, but it was really a revelation to me. Because what it shows me is that in the end of all theology, the purpose of knowing more and more about God, the purpose of learning more and more about Christ, it all ends in love. That's the point. That's what it all points to. All the theology, all the doctrine Paul's been carefully explaining in these first three chapters, all the intricate theological doctrine of Romans that scholars love to write books about, it's all for the purpose of increasing your love for God. The more you know of God, the more you know of his love toward you, the more you comprehend the love of Christ, the more you grow. The more full you are of the fullness of God. That's it. You can all go home now. That's a summary of these new people, neither Gentile nor Jew, that Paul has been explaining in the first three chapters. That's his final word on the mystery that's been hidden for so long and is being made known just now as he writes. Love is how he summarizes us being built into a new structure, a holy living temple for the Lord himself. What Paul is saying, one thing he's saying, he's saying many things. One thing that the Bible is saying to us in this passage is that we must have the love of Christ because there is nothing else binding us all together. Look around you. No, really, look around you. Yeah. What do you, what do you have in common with these other people? Why are you all in this room instead of fishing or sleeping in or visiting or washing your car? Nothing except the love of Christ binding us all together. We're not the same family. We're not all bird watchers or here for a yoga class or line dancing or whatever reason groups of people who don't know each other get together, social dancing. There's only one reason you're in this room with a bunch of people you're not related to, you don't work with, and you wouldn't really know any other way. The love of Christ. You are here because we are rooted in the love of Christ, and with all the saints, we're coming to comprehend, slowly, slowly, <laughs> frustratingly slowly for some of us, the breadth, length, height, and depth of the love of Christ. If we don't have that, then we're just a bunch of people who rolled in here on a Sunday morning to do a bit of singing, listen to some guy talk, and think nice thoughts, have a cup of tea, and go home. What Paul's saying is the end of all theology, the end of all doctrine, is love. The love of God, the love of Christ, because that's where it started, and in the end, that's all we have. So the love of Christ is the only thing binding us all together. If you don't have that, we as a group are nothing. To have Christ's love, we need the strength and power that comes only from God. So before we dive straight into this, the actual, there, that was all int introduction. Uh, before we dive straight in, there are three things that should be explained, and they occur in verses 14 and 15, which I'll read again. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. First, Paul starts off by saying, for this reason, class, pop quiz, what's the reason? Glad you asked. We know that Paul tends to interrupt himself. We saw at the beginning of chapter 3 that Paul started to pray, but in verse 2 he broke off into a digression about the gospel he was delegated by God to bring to the Gentiles, you know, how we're fellow heirs of the promise of Christ Jesus through the gospel, and that together, Jew and Gentile in Christ would be a new thing, which until now had been a mystery that God was creating his new humanity, which is the church. He ends this digression just before our passage in verse, verses 11 through 13 by saying that this was the eternal purpose of God. This is the reason he's suffering, to bring this gospel to the people he's writing this letter to. Okay, so in verse 14, he's getting back to where he was in verse 1. He's going to pray now, and he says, For this reason, because of what God is doing, creating a new humanity, building us into a living temple, his church, because of this, Paul now bows his knees before the Father. 
And this is the second thing you need to understand. I mean, aren't we supposed to kneel when we pray? Does anybody here kneel when they pray at home? I'm just curious. Does anybody kneel? There I go. Thank you. Thank you. I see that hand, brother. <laughs> I mean, isn't that normal? Well, for some of some, some of us men, maybe. For first century Jews, this was not normal at all. Think of those images you've seen of those ultra pious Jews in front of the Western Wall in Jerusalem. Here they are in the holiest place they can find on earth. They're praying. Are they kneeling? No, they're standing. Jews stood to pray. If you knelt when you prayed, that meant that you were overcome with the powerful emotion of a very, very strong prayer. King Solomon knelt to pray at the dedication of the temple, and I think that's one of only two or three times in the entire Old Testament that somebody was noted as kneeling when they prayed. So when Paul says he bows his knees before the Father, he's not just calling attention to the fact that he's praying, He's letting the people know that he's being deeply affected by what he's praying. This is no ordinary prayer. I mean, if he was on Facebook, this would, this would be caps lock praying. Okay. And this, there's something much more deep and powerful about this. This is prayer with a very, very strong intent behind it. It's almost like, and when you read it, it's almost like it's come, you know, Paul was dictating this. Paul wasn't weighing it out by hand. And it's almost like it's coming together in Paul's mind as he dictates this that it's hitting him as he's speaking, especially at the end of chapter, verses 20 21, which is just a rush of emotion. And the third thing is verse 15, where Paul says, For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. And what Paul's doing here is making a play on words, which is really funny in the Greek, but it doesn't really come through in English, <laughs> with Father, Pater, and the family Patria, indicating that God has authority and power over all creation the way a father has over his family. What it is not saying is that everybody on earth is in God's family. Okay. It's saying that God is the father of all humanity in a creative sense, not in a relational sense. So, these three things. Paul's praying for the church for the reason that we are a new humanity, the revealed mystery of God. The fact that Paul makes a point of telling the people he's kneeling shows how serious this prayer is. And he's praying to God as the creator and ruler of the world. Now, I spent a great deal of time, of the time that I spent preparing for the sermon, trying to figure out the structure. In the Greek, verses 14 through 19 is all one very long, very complicated Greek sentence with nominatives and participles and henas and therefores. And what it does is it sketches out a series of cause and effect. Paul prays for this so this might happen. And when that happens, something else happens, and so on, until we finally get to what it is Paul wants for us all along, the end result. Okay, and once I figured out what I was doing, I saw that love is literally at the center of the whole passage. Paul prays for three things, strength, love, and fullness. Of these three, love is central. The prayer is first how to get the love of God in our lives, and then what the result of, the, of that love is in our lives. Okay. So if I could sum up in one sentence, I would say that the point of this passage is to show you that the more you know, the more you understand, the more you know the love of Christ for you, the more you will have the fullness of Christ in your life. Now, that might sound like a lot of abstract theological terms. We'll bring, the rest of the sermon is we'll be bringing that down to earth. But in other words, growing in Christ's love is the way to grow to be the mature Christian person that God wants you to be. As commentator, commentator Klein Snodgrass put it, if you have the strength to know the love of Christ in his presence, all else will fall into place. And I believe that. This passage explains how that happens in five steps, five points. So we don't have three kids' points today. We have five adult points today. Point one, we are strengthened with power through the Holy... Don't worry about writing down. I'll be repeating these a lot. 
Point one, we are strengthened with power through the Holy Spirit in our inner being. Point two, having the Holy Spirit in our inner being allows Christ to dwell in our hearts through faith. Okay. Point three, the result of Christ dwelling in our hearts through faith is that we are rooted and grounded in love. Point four, the result of us being rooted and grounded in love is that we have the strength to comprehend with all the saints the breadth, length, height, and depth of Christ's love. Point five, when we live in that, we are filled with all the fullness of God. Okay. Notice the order. You can't skip a step. It doesn't work that way. The reason Paul prays for us in this order is because this order is how it happens. But, but let's uh, go to the end just for a second so we know where we're going to end up. When you start out on a journey, it's always good to know where you're heading toward. That makes it easier to follow the progression of what Paul is saying. Ultimately, what Paul wants for us is verse 19. Step five. The end result of everything Paul prays in this section is that we in the church may be filled with all the fullness of God. That's the goal. Think of it this way. If God is the ocean, you walk into the ocean with an empty jar. You reach down and you fill the jar with water. Do you have the fullness of the ocean in your jar? It's not a trick question, people. No, of course not. But is everything in the jar ocean? Yes. You have a tiny, tiny part of, of the ocean, but it's 100% full ocean. Okay. That's what Paul wants for us. That's what God wants for us, to be 100% filled with the fullness of God. Now, we're, n <laughs> we're never going to reach that in this life, okay? Just spoiler alert here. You're never going to make it. But we should never stop having that as our goal. We should never stop trying for that. We should never want less than that. And the passage for today sketches out the process God has ordained for this to happen in our lives. Look, we know we'll always have sin in our lives, okay? But we must never be at peace with that. We must never accept any sin as, oh, that's just me, I can't change. You ever said that to yourself? Oh, that's just me, I can't change. Friends, you have the Holy Spirit in your inner being, the power of God in your life to overcome any and every sin. As a great Puritan theologian John Owen put it, if you're not killing sin, sin is killing you. Again, you will always have sin, but you must never, ever accept and be comfortable with that. Now, this will come up again in the passage, the idea that we must try to do the impossible in verses 18 and 19, where Paul tells us to comprehend the love of Christ that is beyond your ability to comprehend. Well, thanks, Paul. Not that we'll ever accomplish that, but it's in the trying that you grow. Does anybody remember Bjorn Borg, that great Swedish tennis star from the 1970s? When he was a kid, he practiced by hitting a tennis ball against a wall, over and over. I mean, I don't know, maybe a lot of tennis players train, train that way. Why? Do they think they can beat the wall? Maybe someday they'll be good enough to whack the ball through the wall? No. They know they're never going to defeat the wall, but that's not the point. The point is that by playing tennis against a wall, you get to be a much, much better tennis player. It's in the effort of chasing an impossibility that we discover how much ability God has actually given us. And friends, we never even come to the end of that. So no, you, you'll never be 100% completely filled with the fullness of God, as Paul prays here. Paul knows that. I know that. God knows that. But you can't be more full now than you were last year. You can be more full next year than you are now. We must always be growing. How do we do that? That's what the passage tells us. Point one. We are strengthened with power through the Holy Spirit and our inner being, and we only get this from God. Pray that God gives you the strength the power that comes only from the Holy Spirit. Now, please understand, I have to maybe clear a bit of underbrush here, 
This is not talking about some kind of second blessing that you might hear charismatic Christians claim. The idea of Christians receiving more of the Holy Spirit and some kind of baptism of the Spirit after salvation, completely unscriptural. That's not what we're talking about at all here. Every Christian believer is given the full measure of the Holy Spirit at conversion. When you confess your sin, when you repent of your sin, ask God to forgive your sin based only on the blood of Christ from his atonement on the cross for your sin, instantly you are adopted into the family of God. Praise God. Instantly you have the full, complete, entire indwelling of the Holy Spirit. You don't get some of the Holy Spirit and then gradually more and more of the Holy Spirit as you grow. You have the complete Holy Spirit from day one whose power, as it says in verse 20, is able to do far more abundantly than all you can think or ask. Now, of course, you're still a baby, spiritually speaking. When a human baby is one day old, does he have all the muscles he will ever have in his entire life? Does he get added more muscles as he grows? Zelda? It's not a trick question. No, of course not. Every baby from the instant they're born, they have all the muscles they will ever have, right? It's the work of a lifetime to grow and strengthen those muscles. Spiritually, it's the same way. Pray for God to give you the strength and power through the Holy Spirit, then use that strength and power, and it grows stronger in your life. Spiritual strength is a spiritual muscle. I wasn't sure how to quite phrase this, so if I'm committing heresy, please forgive me. But, I mean, the idea, because I, I wanted to get away from work sal salvation, but spiritual strength is a spiritual muscle. It needs to be used, and if you use it, it grows stronger, okay? We are fully capable of obeying everything the Bible tells us to do, once we're a believer. We have the power of the Holy Spirit, God himself, in our inner being. There is no sin in your life. It is beyond your power to kill, I guess is the main point. But will we? We have the strength. Do we use it? Pastor Ken Hughes gives an excellent illustration of how this works as an upward spiral. The Spirit strengthens us so we can draw more deeply from him. Drawing more deeply on the Spirit enlarges our capacity so we can kind of hold more of him, so to speak, which means we need more strength, <laughs> and so on until we get the fullness of God that we get to enjoy in this life. Okay, this is step one. You cannot skip step one. If you do not have the Holy Spirit, if you haven't repented of your sin and asked for God's forgiveness, you're not a Christian no matter how good you are, how often you come to church, how much you read your Bible how many Christian friends you have, get right with God first. Okay. Now you say, aren't these Christians Paul's writing to? Don't they already have the Holy Spirit? Yes. What Paul is praying is that the Spirit be awakened in power in their lives. Now, as a wise man once said, the Holy Spirit does not engage with unwilling, inattentive human spirits. It is possible to frustrate the work of the Spirit at points in your life. Not ultimately, but at points. You can make the work of the Holy Spirit a lot harder than you have to. <laughs> Obedience is a spiritual muscle you must work to strengthen the Spirit that is already in you. Okay. So that's point one. We are strengthened by the power of the Holy Spirit in our inner beings. Point two, having the Holy Spirit in our inner being allows Christ to dwell in our hearts through faith. And we're talking about verse 17 here, which says, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Now, following the flow chart here, think cause and effect. When you have been strengthened with power through the Spirit, according to the riches of God's glory, when the Father has given you the Spirit in your inner being, then Christ can dwell in your heart through faith. Now, we've all heard that expression, Jesus lives in your heart. I have Jesus in my heart. I used to sing songs about a Christian camp when I was a little kid. I've got Jesus in my heart. I don't remember how it goes. And yes, this is one of those places where Paul uses that expression to describe our relationship with Christ. But far more often, Paul and the Bible 
emphasize that actually we are in Christ. Okay, that's another whole set of sermons we won't get into now. But the word that Paul uses here, translated dwell, is a very strong word. It means not just to have a residence somewhere. It means to be fully, comfortably at home in charge of that place. Okay? You make it your own. You're not just passing through. Okay? You dwell in a home. You do not dwell in a hotel room. Christ dwells in your heart through the Spirit. This means you are rooted in Christ. Your life is on the firm foundation of Christ. As you live the Christian life with Christ dwelling in you, see your spiritual muscles getting stronger and stronger, you become more patient. You desire to read the Bible more. You take more and more opportunities to share your faith. You pray more. You find yourself responding in a more Christ-like manner to those around you. Okay? In doing these things, you're able to use more of the Spirit's power. You come to know, you come to experience more and more of the love of Christ who is dwelling within you. Okay. So what we've described up to this point can be called a state of affairs, more, more or less. Point two is that having the Holy Spirit in your inner being allows Christ to dwell in your heart through faith. Now, point three is kind of the central one. When Christ is dwelling in your heart through faith, the result of that is that you are rooted and grounded in love. In verse 17, the kind of love Paul is talking about here is God's love. And please, friends, let's be very, very clear here. (laughs) This is not talking about the love you have for God. When verse 17 talks about being rooted and grounded in love, it does not mean the love you have for God. That is the farthest thing from Paul's mind. Because believe me, ain't nothing rooted or grounded about our love for God. If that's what you're depending on, your love for God, you in a heap of trouble. The focus on verse 17 is on the deep, solid roots and foundations in love of God for us. Nothing can shake that. Nothing's going to ever change that. And this is because God's love, as I said before, this defines who we are. We are the people beloved of God. From now through all eternity to the end of time, hallelujah. And that is all. That is all. We are held together by nothing else other than the love of Christ for us. We are in this room. We are in the church universal across the world today and across all time. We have no natural bonds. It must be God's love creating us as a new humanity for his glory or we are nothing. And that's what we need to sink our roots down deeply into. That is the solid ground. That's the rock we need for our firm foundation. God's love for us. All the theology, all the doctrine that Paul has been explaining in the first three chapters, it's all meant to show us more and more clearly the love of God. As we draw from the same soil of love, we all stay united in love. So point three The result of Christ dwelling in our hearts is that we are rooted and grounded in love. Now, point four is when that happens. When we are rooted and grounded in love, this is where growth happens. Because now we have the strength to comprehend with all the saints the breadth, length, height, and depth of Christ's love. That surpasses knowledge because it's the love of experience. Do not overlook right there In the middle of verse 18, how you're deeply rooted in Christ along with all the saints, not in isolation. We know God's love only in community, people. And I know it sounds strange for the Bible to talk about knowing the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. Okay, that's called an oxymoron where I come from. It does sound weird, but how do you know the love that is beyond knowledge? Well, you experience it. It's like Jonathan Edwards, his famous illustration about honey. If you have never tasted honey, I can't really explain it to you. (laughs) You must have the experience. Through obedience to the word of God, you have the strength in you to follow Christ. Doing so, you experience the love of Christ as you grow more and more like him. Now, 
uh, in your translation, you will probably notice that the passage doesn't explicitly say that Christ's love is being talked about here, the comprehending the breadth, length, height, and depth. I think only the New International explicitly translates it of Christ's love. That's not what it says in the Greek. But it's what most scholars agree that it means. And I think that's what it means, too. So, me and Jonathan Edwards. <laughs> We need to simply come to a deeper, ever deeper understanding and recognition of all that God has done for us purely out of love. The more aware we are of what Christ has done for us in love, the more dedicated we are to living for his glory. Okay. Point four was that the result of us being rooted and grounded in love from Christ dwelling in us, remember, is that we have the strength to comprehend with all the saints the breadth, length, height, and depth of Christ's love. Now, point five is the culmination of the whole process. When we live in ever-increasing comprehension of the love of Christ, we are filled more and more with all the fullness of Christ. Now, there's an, another name we call this, okay? This is called spiritual growth, Christian maturity. Sanctification. God making us slowly, slowly over an entire lifetime into the people he created us to be. So by the end of verse 19, we now understand that the ultimate reason for God strengthening us with power in our inner beings is for us to be filled with all the fullness of God. We understand that the ultimate reason for Christ dwelling in our hearts through faith is for us to be filled with all the fullness of God. We understand that the ultimate reason for Christ rooting and grounding us firmly in his love is for us to be filled with all the fullness of God. We understand that the ultimate reason for the strength in us to comprehend the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge is for us to be filled with all the fullness of God Friends, this is the journey that your life is. It's called sanctification. It's a lifelong process of God strengthening you by Christ dwelling in you by the power of the Holy Spirit to, for you to be filled with the fullness of God himself becoming more and more like Christ. And it happens through love. The first few times I read verse 18, where Paul's praying that I may have the strength to comprehend the love of Christ, I thought, this is weird. I mean, does it hit anybody else as strange that you need strength to know something? Is that? Okay, it's only me, fine. I mean, you know, can't I just know something? If you tell me something, you know, I know it. What strength do I need for that? But what it means, <clears throat> what verses 18 to 19 are saying is that as we grow stronger in Christ, we obey him more by his power. Only then can we experience, no experience, no experience, the love of Christ more and more. The more you learn of God intellectually, yes, the more you can praise and worship him for who he is. The more you live in obedience to Christ by his strength, the more you experience his love and are moved to praise and worship him for that. And then the result of that wonderful upward spiral of getting stronger and being able to live more by obedience and the power of God is you do experience more of the love of Christ and you do end up being more and more filled with the fullness of God. The Bible uses fullness a lot. God never talks about being somewhat filled. God's plan is not for, is not for us to be somewhat spiritual kind of powerful. God's goal is never anything less than our complete fullness. But how hard are we still fighting to hold on to those things God wants us to get out of our lives? How hard are we really striving to follow the Spirit's work in transforming us so we can have more of the fullness of God? Okay, so, drawing it all together now. We see that love is at the literal center of our passage. Looking back at our five points, the first two, that we are strengthened with power through the Holy Spirit, and that Christ is dwelling in our hearts through faith, 
These result in the middle point, point three, that you're rooted and grounded in love. And when that's true, when you're rooted and grounded in God's love, the result of that is the next two points. You have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth, length, height, and depth of Christ's love, and you're filled with the fullness of God. Now, really, that's the perfect way for Paul to end the whole theology section of Ephesians. By telling the people in his church, listening to this being read out, that the summary of all theology, the end result of all learning about God, is love. Do you want to be more spiritually powerful? Don't answer. Do you really want to experience more and more of the depths of Christ's love? Because it might cost you some things that you're enjoying already. Let Jesus, who is right now dwelling in your inner being, through the power of the Holy Spirit, control more of your life. Read your Bible more to get to know him for who he really is and what he really wants for you. Make a routine of it. Leave your Bible open on your nightstand and put your phone to charge in the kitchen. So when you wake up in the morning, the first thing you see is your Bible open to the passage for that morning, not your email. Spend more time in prayer. Ask someone what you can pray for them for this week, so you will pray. Stop taking shortcuts to the good things God has already promised to give you, and watch your life become more and more marked by the exceeding abundant, more than you can ask or think kind of power from God that verse 20 talks about. Now the best example of this would have to be Paul himself. Imagine it. On the road to Damascus, Paul, boom, zapped by God. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? You know, he's struck blind by God. And when he comes to, when he realizes what he's been doing for his whole life, persecuting God himself, I'm sure that at that moment, he's just simply grateful that God didn't kill him. If you had come to him in that moment, or probably any time in his first year of life in Christ, and you asked him, Paul, what's God going to do with you? How's God going to work through you, Paul? He might just just say, I have no idea. I'm just grateful I'm alive, really. (laughs) I can't think of anything else I could do than just help me thank and praise him. Yeah. But look what God ends up doing with Paul. (laughs) Exceeding abundantly more than he could have ever thought or asked, right? And and, ends up writing a lot of the New Testament. Paul had his inner being strengthened by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's for sure. He grew deep roots in Christ's love. He built his life completely fully on the firm foundation of the love of God, the love of Christ. As a result, Christ dwelled with Paul. Paul dwelled in Christ. He was constantly obeying God by the power of the Spirit. He was constantly experiencing more and more of the breadth, length, height, and depth of the love of Christ as a result. He was never perfect. He himself would would tell you that. I mean, he does wrong things you have recorded in scripture. But he let himself be filled more and more with all the fullness of God and ended up being used by God in an exceedingly abundantly powerful way that he never could have imagined. Do you want that for your life? Paul wants that for you. That's why he prayed this prayer for you. God wants it for you. God wants your life to be exceedingly, abundantly more than you can ask or think. Let us pray. We thank you for this word, Father, and what I pray we would all take home from this is that you have exceedingly, abundantly more for each of us than we can ever ask or think. And I said that would become more and more important and more and more powerful in our lives through the power of the Spirit and Christ dwelling in us. Amen.